Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Ethiopia is Africa's second most populous nation and has big ambitions to be a dominant regional power. It also has a new leader, Abiy Ahmed, who has pledged to heal internal divisions after years of authoritarian rule. Well, my guest is Nyamin Zelika, one of the leaders in exile of an Ethiopian opposition movement which has embraced armed resistance to the Addis regime. So, how real is the threat of conflict inside Ethiopia? Yamin Zelika in Washington, D.C. Welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. Would you agree with me that given the appointment of a new prime minister, this is a moment of hope and opportunity for Ethiopia? Yes, uh, we see some opportunities and uh, definitely hope. But uh, the uh, challenges and uh, the political crisis facing Ethiopia are really enormous. And uh, he has uh, uh, on his way uh, way too much complex uh, problems to tackle. Uh, so there is hope and there is an opportunity if he uses it, if he has the political will to use the opportunities to make substantive uh, political and economic reforms. The reforms may come, but should we pause for just a moment and reflect on how symbolically important it is that here we have a man who is, first of all, the first Muslim to be leader of Ethiopia, but also a man who comes from the Oromo ethnic uh, part of the country and therefore breaks the monopoly on power that has been held by the Tigrayans inside the ruling coalition for the last quarter century or so. So would you accept that, that this does indicate a wind of change sweeping through your country? Well, uh, first of all, uh, this is not the first time an Oromo leader came on power in Ethiopia. Uh, previously, there were two Oromo prime minister and the leader of the military regime. But of course, he may identify himself primarily as ethnic Oromo. Second, uh, uh, definitely, as I said, there is hope and opportunity for the country because according to the information we have, he came to the helm as a chairman of the PDRF and also subsequently prime minister as a result of internal struggle within the ruling APRDF, and uh, he uh, is apparently uh, among those uh, wanting some reform measures within the ruling APDRF. In that sense, if he follows through, mm. then there is hope for the country. And, and let me, if I but may, still, if keep I may. in mind that uh, yeah. keep in mind that APDRF is still the dominant authoritarian party and he's the leader of that party. So his challenge will be to transform and reform the country towards a genuine political order. Yes, uh, indeed. So here's something he said uh, around the time uh, of, of swearing in as new PM. He said, I apologize wholeheartedly to the families of human rights defenders, politicians, the change-seeking youth whose lives were snapped at a young age, and all of those who were subjected to psychological and physical crises. That apology is something which does change the atmosphere, does it not? It does, uh, to a degree, but uh, the regime, uh, you know, has been, you know, known uh, in the past to make uh, public apologies after committing crimes, atrocities, and violations in various parts of Ethiopia. So this is not, 
in particular, uh, you know, new for the leaders of the current authoritarian regime to apologize. It's not Definitely, just, it's not just there words. There is a marked yeah, difference. It's, it's, it's not, not just words, though. It's also actions. Uh, you know, uh, under the outgoing PM, Haile Mariam, we saw hundreds of pr political prisoners released. And indeed, in the first days of the new PM, we've seen more releases, 11 anti-government bloggers, journalists and activists who were jailed uh, actually in March during some clashes and, and security sweeps by the government. They were released, including some well-known online activists from the Zone 9 group, uh, including two journalists, Eskinder Neger being one of them, who are well-known in Ethiopia as oppositionists. These are, again, I, I just wonder whether you're just being a little gloomy and a bit of a naysayer when some really important, different things are happening inside your country. Yes, uh, there are some changes. As I said, uh, we see some glimmer of ho hope and uh, opportunities going forward. But uh, let's take, for instance, what you just said, the release of political prisoners. Uh, you know what happened after they released hundreds of political prisoners? They rearrested, uh, you know, the most prominent one, including the one you mentioned, uh, Skander Naga. You know, the problem is not yeah, but they, releasing they let him out again. <laughs> I agree with yes, you. They yes. rearrested him, see, but now they've uh, let him uh, out again. To begin with, to begin with, uh, with all due respect, all these political prisoners should not have been put in prison because they didn't commit any crime. Their only crime was to be a journalist like you and political dissenters like me. So this authoritarian, deeply authoritarian, brutal regime imprisoned in the past thousands of political prisoners in Ethiopia. These are just, you know, few that were released. We still believe there are 10,000 of political prisoners throughout Ethiopia in many regions of the country, not only in Addis Ababa. Yeah, but so that... <laughs> That has to end. You know, criminalization of dissent has to end. Uh, all these repressive laws, the authoritarian regime, APDRF has instituted, they have to be repealed. And the uh, state of emergency has to be lifted. All these measures will indicate what you said. But if there is hope and opportunity. Right. Is not the message of what has happened over the last 18 months, two years and more, that civil disobedience, mass peaceful protests on the streets of Ethiopia's towns and cities can work. And that you guys in exile who call for armed resistance have not been the agent and vehicle of change. It's the people inside the country committed to peaceful resistance who have achieved this change? First of all, definitely we have an outfit, organizational outfit in exile. But keep in mind, it's a fact, we are also on the ground. We are deeply, in many parts of Ethiopia, we are active. Our movement works not only through armed struggle, but part of the civil disobedience that you mentioned. So we espouse not only an armed struggle, but we embrace all forms of struggle, well, including with respect, civil disobedience. With, with respect, you, you are an organization which is deemed a terrorist organization and is outlawed inside Ethiopia. As I understand it, you inside the country operate with a secret cell structure. So you're not the people who've been on the ground organizing the, the, uh, the protests on the streets, the... Uh, uh, protests outside gas stations and, and other forms of civil disobedience because you're a secret cell structure banned organization. My point is that there are groups like, for example, the Kiro group in Oromo who have been on the streets, active youth movements, who've achieved real change. No, I think you have uh, your information wrong. Uh, the, we are on the ground. Yes, we are banned and uh, branded as a terrorist, but we do have structures inside Ethiopia undertaking and organizing civil disobedience, not only uh, self-defense, armed uh, 
uh, undertakings, but also civil disobedience. Yes, this is true that the Cairo and the Oromo areas and in other regions, other groups are uh, organizing and leading this uh, civil disobedience, but we are there as well. We are uh, in many parts of the country part of this process. Your movement is called the Ginbot Sabat movement and you, as I understand it, have committed. Last May you made this public commitment to, quote, depose the government by any means necessary. You talk to yes. me. Yes. Yeah, you talk to me about armed resistance. Yes, arm, armed, yes, armed by armed any resistance. means necessary. Me Armed by resistance. Any means necessary. Yeah, yeah armed resistance is not what has been happening in Ethiopia in terms of pushing the government to release prisoners and to change course. It is civil disobedience. And are you not playing into the hands of the hardliners in the ruling coalition when you talk about deposing the government by any means necessary? When we say by any means necessary, it means all instruments of struggle, all forms of tactics uh, we deploy to organize the people. That includes armed struggle. We have armed movements in the northern part of the, the country. And we also believe civil disobedience, uh, economic embargoes, and boycotts of all kinds to blunt the regime's uh, repressive arsenals, to erode uh, and to uh, weaken the pillars of its uh, repression. So we believe in all forms of struggle. When we say by any means necessary, we don't exclude civil disobedience as a very potent weapon to weaken the regime and to organize the people in this protest to uh, depose the regime. Where is your leader, the Ginbot Sabat leader, Nega Brahanu? Where is he? Professor Brahanu Naga is currently in Eritrea. In Eritrea? Yes. Yes, and Eritrea, of course, long-term hostile enemy of Ethiopia. It doesn't look good, does it, when you, and I know you go to Eritrea too, you spend all of your time uh, not in Ethiopia and not always in Washington, but much of your time in a country which is the most hostile enemy of Ethiopia. Well, uh, Eritrea is the most hostile enemy of the regime in Ethiopia, not Ethiopians and Ethiopia. We disagree on that one. And, uh, you know, this uh, regime, especially the dominant Tigran, TPLF, uh, uh, People's Liberation Front, has worked with Eritreans to fight against the previous uh, military regime, communist regime. So why would it be wrong for us to work with Eritreans? Just makes me wonder. Don't you think uh, it makes me wonder about where your interests really lie. How much money? Uh, does, how much money does the Eritrean government give your organization? I cannot speculate on that. Uh, they don't give us money, but they harbor uh, thousands of our freedom fighters in Eritrea because that's the only safe and secure place for Ethiopians. You know, this brutal regime can go at will and whim in neighboring countries: uh, Kenya, Uganda. Sudan, Djibouti, abduct and assassinate Ethiopian but, dissidents uh, but, and but, even but, journalists but, like yeah. you. So the only, the safest place for all those brutalized, persecuted Ethiopians is Eritrea. But they do give you money, don't they? I mean, I've read the UN monitoring. They may, they may. Yes. I'm not going to speculate the amount, no. when and where. They may support us. They do definitely support our freedom fighters. Yes. Well, they, they, they you, you denied they gave you money, but they do give you money. The UN I, I monitoring. I didn't deny. All right. Well, the UN. I deny. Well, then you surely know how much your the foreign they, affairs they, spokesman they, they, for. I just told you there are thousands of our freedom fighters, not only our organization but others. They harbor and they keep, they shelter and they provide them with all uh, all it's, forms of assistance. Yes, yes. it's many thousands. According, 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 according to the UN money. According to the UN monitoring money. group, it's it's many thousands of dollars a month are handed to you and your fellow leaders of Ginbot Sabat, that and also arms and training camps inside Eritrea. I'm just wondering how all of this sounds to the Ethiopian people. They, of course, will remember the, the years the of Ethiopian war with people, Eritrea. Uh, uh, the, we are the most popular organization, one of the most popular. The Ethiopian, we have millions of supporters in Ethiopia. I don't know if you have your data and information correctly or which uh, versions of uh, 
the reports, uh, there are various reports from various entities that you are reading, but we have solid support in Ethiopia, and the Ethiopian people, they no longer see Eritrea and Eritrean people as enemies. It's the regime that has been, uh, you know, uh, at loggerheads with, uh, and also wants to, uh, the, has hostile intention towards Eritrea and the Eritrean government. Right, so you take, the side, you, take, you take the side of Eritrea against your own government? It is not our own government. Our own government is when we, the people, elect under free, fair uh, elections our government. This is a dictatorial, tyrannical, brutal regime, a minority regime that has captured the state and the economy to benefit a few Tigran elites and their cronies, ethnic and political cronies. So this is not our uh, government. Until we, the Ethiopian people, like you in Britain, under free and fair election, we elect our leaders. This is not our government. Just seems and that's to me, the sentiment. Of, that is the sentiment of the majority of Ethiopians seems to in me Ethiopia. You're going to have a problem if Dr. Abiy, uh, in his role now as prime minister, makes good on his promise, which he stated again just a few days ago, uh, to uh, end the, quote, years of misunderstandings with the Eritrean government. And to that end, we will play our part. You're going to be in big trouble if the Ethiopian government reaches out a hand of friendship to Eritrea because you'll be bargaining chips and you and your fellow leaders of Ginbot Sabat may find yourselves without a home. Well, we shall see when we get there, but uh, I don't believe so. First of all, the minority regime has to withdraw from Badim. As you know, there is a long-standing uh, you know, ruling by the commission, by the Boundary Commission which awarded Bademme, the flashpoint of the dispute and conflict that led to that bloody war, to Eritrea. But uh, thus far, the regime has no withdrawn from Bademme. Uh, these are, uh, according to the ruling, you know, sovereign territories of uh, Eritrea. That will be, uh, you know, a very difficult undertaking for the regime because most Tigrans uh, consider Bademme as uh, part of uh, Tigray, not Eritrea. So we'll see when we get there anyway. Uh, and just a quick word about Egypt, uh, another country that does not have a good relationship with Ethiopia right now, not least because of disputes about water and the, the, the waters of the Nile. Um, you are taking money and support from Egypt too. Uh, <laughs> that, that's uh, that's uh, the narrative and uh, the fiction of the regime. Uh, we never took uh, you know, money, neither weapons or any form of assistance from Egypt. But if if it serves our end, and our end is to have a genuine democratic political order in Ethiopia like you have in Britain, we will deal with anybody except terrorists, with any government. Well, well, you know, don't you think it's a double standard? Uh, you know, the, the, your government or any government deals with uh, whoever serves their interests. So uh, our interest is democracy, freedom, justice, equity in Ethiopia, and these are lacking in Ethiopia. That's why you have it's protests throughout Ethiopia in the past three years. But, but, but with respect, so, it's so long as it serves our uh, purpose, we'll do it. But so far, yeah. we have not accepted any form of assistance well, from Egyptians. So you say, but uh, there's a very strange statement you just made to me that we'll accept any assistance from anybody except terrorists. I mean, yes. y you conduct terrorism yourselves. You've just said to me no, that- oh, Well, that's what, the regime says, look, under tyranny, well, hang the rebel is a right. Let me, it's let, a, it's let, a morally let, let, let justified, me, if I not may, only politically, if I, morally justified to defend yourself when your families are being tortured, when your sisters are being gang raped, when your father is being humiliated and uh, murdered. That's what has been happening, and this, this minority regime, supported by those who uh, champion or claim to yeah, champion but, democracy and freedom, uh, you know, throughout the world, including the UK. But, but if, you, if you want to claim that you are better than the government in Ethiopia, I don't see how it helps for your people claiming loyalty but, to you to launch sir, uh, gun, and, gun and bomb attacks. With all due as, respect, uh, you on, remember on, you on, interviewed Malla Zenawi, you know? Malla Zenawi, 10 years ago, I recall you remember. And our leader, you know, was among the victims, those thrown in jail, the leaders of CUD. He tried his best, and many others who formed Gumbo 7 were leaders of that CUD, including our chairman. They tried their best peacefully, and this regime doesn't understand 
peaceful struggle. So you Even think it's now acceptable to launch gun and bomb attacks which kill dozens of people? No, 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 no. We don't believe in terrorism and we don't promote terrorism. We conduct self-defense measures, armed uh, activities in self-defense. I just wonder... And that's a right. Even under international law, self-defense, defending yourself, your families from brutality, atrocity, bordering genocide, ethnic cleansing that this brutal minority regime has undertaken yeah. throughout Ethiopia, just it's a right to defend yourself. But, 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 Don't you but, think? But, but, what would happen, <laughs> let me ask you, mm. what would happen if the IRA from Ireland comes take over Britain, okay, captures all the economy? Uh, uh, Irish people, only 4 million out of the 60 million, they control the economy, they control the military, the security. What would you feel? And you, as a journalist, <laughs> are you not? How do you react? Are you not playing with fire here? We know that Ethiopia's ethnic mix is, to put it bluntly, fragile. And we know when you accuse the government of being a front for Tigrayan security, military, and intelligence interests, we know that that kind of language is going to inflame ethnic tensions, given the, the mix of peoples in your country. And it seems to me, when you tweet yeah. things like this, and I'm going to quote a tweet of yours from just a, yes. a month ago, you said, give me death or give me liberty. Either we live with freedom so and equality, uh, or oppression, injustice and servitude under this brutal fascist tyranny will be the option. You are laying things out in a way which seems to me leading only one way, and that's to the type, kind of terrible civil war that we have seen in Syria, for example. We don't want a civil war in Ethiopia. We want peace, we want stability, we want prosperity, but with justice, freedom, like you, as I said, in Britain or any Western democracy. We want this unacceptable, brutal, tyrannical order to go. We need freedom. We need justice. We need equity. The, you know, but it is a known fact now internationally that 6% of the population, all, if you look at, read at all the reports recently that have been uh, written by various journalists, uh, Western journalists included, for the first time they are admitting that people who claim to represent 6% of the population out of 100 million have captured the state, the security, the military, and the economy. That, that, that's the truth. But to now, avoid, my last question, to avoid the possibility of terrible violence inside your country, do you not now have to give Dr. Abi, the new PM, a chance, a chance to lift the state of emergency, a chance to develop a dialogue with the opposition, a chance to yes. release the political prisoners. Give him a chance. Yes, we will give him a chance. We have stated in no uncertain terms, we have issued a public statement and interviews, including by our chairman on VOA. We are willing to give a chance, provided Dr. Abi, the prime minister, delivers what he has pledged, reconciliation, national dialogue, and an instituting constitutional democracy and all the substantive political and economic reforms that the people of Ethiopia expect. Yes, right. we'll give them a chance. All right, well, with that thought in mind, we must end this interview. But Nyamin Zulaka, thank you for being on Hard Talk.